level. Thanks, Alex. Thanks for putting this together, you and, and your colleagues at Doheny. And it's nice to be with you all here this afternoon. What I'd like to do <clears throat> in the next 20 minutes is to share some, um, some concepts, some thoughts, and some data about the importance of the lamina, fibrosa, and glaucoma. These are my financial disclosures, although none really pertain to this uh, presentation. So it's, it's widely accepted that um, the lamina is the primary site of glaucomatous damage. By primary site, I mean the, the, the initiating site of glaucomatous damage. The lamina has been assigned uh, two important and somewhat conflicting um, duties. One is that it has to support the optic nerve while it transits um, the eye, uh, and it has to withstand the strains caused by the pressure that is required by the eye to keep the optical elements in place. And it has to be watertight. And that pathway uh, out of the eye to the brain has to also nourish the ganglion cells uh, on their exit. Now, the lamina is subjected to stresses and strains. The stresses have to do with, at least in part, the pressure in front of the lamina and the pressure behind the lamina. And the strains caused by those fluctuating pressures through a complex relationship between the uh, character of the tissue of the lamina, but not only the lamina, of the surrounding sclera that supports the lamina. You can think of it almost like a, a trampoline, the peripapillary sclera holds the lamina in place and keeps it taut. That's one of the forces that is at work. This is a nice picture from um, Downs and co-workers, which shows the lamina of a, of a primate, the monkey model in glaucoma. And at the top, we see the microstructure of the lamina beams. Here's a strain map, and these are the strains that the pressure stressors are inducing in these lamina beams. And then finally, activation and proliferation of uh, fibroblastic activity in response to those strains. So one of the things that's important to remember is that the lamina is not just a series of dead plates of collagen. Uh, this is a living, uh, remodeling, active tissue. But we're going to talk about pathophysiology and clinical imaging. But first, pathophysiology. So we know that there's deformation um, and remodeling of the lamina over time in patients with glaucoma. Uh, there tends to be stiffening with age. There are changes in the beams and the pores. And there's actually posterior displacement of this insertion of the lamina at the scleral rim. Let me show you a couple of things. This is from uh, one of uh, Quigley's reviews on the subject, and it shows with progressive glaucoma, some changes that occur in the lamina, some coalition of pores, changes in the size of the pores and the beams. And then with uh, advanced glaucoma, there can actually be rupture of the beams. And I'll show you some good OCT examples of that later. Here's the, act the actin uh, cytoskeleton in normal and glaucoma with the uh, activation of fibroblasts and their uh, proliferation of actin cytoskeletal structure. This is uh, an example, again, from a monkey. This is also Claude, uh, Claude Burgoyne's work. And it shows a normal and glaucomatous uh, monkey and that there is posterior movement of the lamina, movement of the actual insertion. So there is always uh, remodeling going on. There is destruction and rebuilding. It's an active living tissue. What about the pressure behind the lamina? So maybe it's important that... Uh, it's not just the pressure in front, but it's the translaminar pressure gradient, which induces some of these strains and stresses. And uh, Jonas has taken up this uh, work in earnest. And the white arrow in the, indicates, of course, the intraocular pressure. The blue arrow is the pressure induced by cerebral spinal fluid pressure. Uh, the white arrows on the right show the lamina. The uh, black arrows show the scleral flange of the, of the uh, lamina. And the black the stars there show the uh, subarachnoid space, so the cerebrospinal fluid pressure. That part of the anatomy, that uh, cerebral, the, the transmission of the cerebrospinal fluid pressure, is somewhat uh, variable. So uh, just because there's pressure there doesn't mean that that pressure 
being transmitted to the posterior lamina. So there, it, it's, it's always more difficult than, than you think it might be at first glance. And what about disc hemorrhages and the relationship of the lamina to disc hemorrhages? Well, there are different kinds of disc hemorrhages. And in this um, review, Lee has nicely pointed out the different kinds. So we see, for instance, this classic sort of uh, splinter hemorrhage that occurs in the peripapillary nerve fiber layer. And it has that appearance because it follows the pathway of the, the axon bundles. There is a component often that is within the substance of the neural rim of the disc. And this looks more globular only because you're sort of looking at, looking at it on end. It's also fusiform, but this is where the axons are now traversing the path going away from you. If you look carefully in your glaucoma patients, you will occasionally find also a disc hemorrhage which uh, is not associated with any apparent neural tissue, just in bare lamina. And this is probably because of uh, a, a, a breach of a capillary within the laminar beam itself. And here are some examples of uh, all of those things. The peripapillary component, here's the neuroretinal rim component with the more um, uh, globular shape on end. And here's one of these laminar uh, hem disc hemorrhages. Also a sign of uh, strain related to stresses that are being placed on the laminar fibrosis. Uh, this author proposed that uh, it, it is, in fact, these stressors, stresses causing uh, glial scar contraction, activation of astrocytes <clears throat> and microglia that causes a physical disruption of these uh, capillaries. Changes in monkeys have been well shown by Claude Burgoyne, um, and they indicate that there is an increased uh, thickness, laminar thickness in early glaucoma, posterior bowing, there's expansion of the scleral canal, and then finally there is this posterior migration of the lamina and thinning. And uh, we can show these on this next slide. So here's the normal in the top left uh, situation. Here we have early glaucoma. There's actually some early uh, thickening of the lamina, likely due to some early uh, uh, remodulation of that tissue. And then finally, in late glaucoma, uh, there is this posterior movement of the insertion, which is shown there, and also this scleral uh, expansion. What can we learn from clinical imaging? Well, uh, we can evaluate laminar morphology and Um, there are changes in the lamina that are global or maybe focalized. We'll look at both of those things. That may help us indicate uh, which patients are more likely to develop damage or to progress at a faster rate. More about that in, in just a minute. We can see the lamina with OCT, although not always very well. Some caveats related to that. Uh, deformations um, are typically evaluated by the lamina position, which is usually measured as the depth of the anterior surface of the lamina, its thickness, a little harder to measure, its shape, and finally, focal changes, which I think are very interesting. I'll show you some examples of that. Um, the image resolution of OCT has been improving steadily with both software and hardware uh, changes. Enhan enhanced depth imaging is a software adaptation. Uh, adaptive optics uh, improves resolution, and the use of a uh, swept source as compared to special domain uh, sources uh, of imaging improve our resolution. So we can begin to uh, assess uh, regional and global parameters, structural parameters of the lamina. Now, the position is normally uh, measured uh, with respect to a reference plane. That's often taken as the Brooks membrane opening, shown in the example here. We know that the LC depth uh, decreases with age. It increases with glaucoma. There is decreased depth reduction, at least in some patients, when the pressure is reduced. Uh, the reference plane with which to measure the depth may be important. 
And so this is an example, for instance, of measuring the depth with respect to the BMO opening, which is this blue line, uh, or the anterior scleral lip, which is the red line. And the one of the important issues is uh, whether or not with age, the choroid thins, that, that we know, and how much of an effect it would have on this measurement of the depth. There was a multi-center uh, normative database uh, that was recently compiled to look at some of the factors that may affect uh, laminar uh, uh, structure. And here's uh, a cross-section of, of the lamina. And here are some of the uh, surfaces and uh, measurements that can be obtained. Here we have the internal aspect of the nerve fiber layer, the posterior edge of the nerve fiber layer, Brooks membrane, the uh, sclera, and the surfaces uh, related to those uh, all those boundaries. Uh, in that study, central lamina depth uh, was found to be deeper in patients of African descent, which I think some of us knew going going way back, looking at the optic nerves, but that was proven with this study. The magnitude of other variables, though, are unclear. They seem to be small, and whether or not they need to be controlled for in studies of progressive glaucoma still needs to be evaluated. However, if you look at the anterior, uh, the depth of the anterior surface of the lamina over time, and this was a paper uh, published by Chris uh, Leung, uh, Laminas that are becoming deeper bode poorly for, for future prognosis. So this is an example of um, a lamina over time getting deeper. And then subsequent to that, the visual field uh, progressed rather quickly as compared to another patient uh, whose lamina position didn't change. We don't know what the pressures are, but the lamina position didn't change and the, and the visual field remained relatively stable after that. These are, of course, two hand-picked examples, but the data sort of uh, bear this out in a, in a general way. When you reduce the pressure uh, in a patient with glaucoma, the lamina often moves forward, but doesn't always. So it can move forward, or over time it can continue to move backward. If it continues to move backward, this slide shows that um, the, uh, the glaucoma tends to be Rapidly, more rapidly progressive. If in a patient you lower the pressure and the, and the lamina moves anteriorly, uh, that holds a much better uh, prognosis for stability. So this could be some sort of a marker for future progression or maybe even improvement. What about the thickness? Normal aging, the lamina gets thicker. Um, in, uh, in glaucoma, particularly advanced glaucoma, it gets thinner. However, there are problems deliminating the, um, the posterior lamina, the posterior edge of the, of the lamina. But one way to do it is to take serial cuts and to look for that section in which you can no longer see the pores. But the visibility <clears throat> in terms of the penetration of the tissue to deep, these deep layers is not uniform and some, some of this data needs to be uh, taken with a grain of salt. In general, the lamina thins in advanced glaucoma, and this just shows an association between the lamina thickness and the uh, retinal nerve fiber layer thickness. What about the shape? Well, we think of the, of the lamina as being slightly posterior bow, posteriorly bowed, and then with glaucoma this damage, it becomes more posteriorly bowed. Um, that's, that's usually true. It's not always. Remember, there are, there are counteracting forces in place. So it's not just the, uh, the lamina, the stiffness or the pliability of the compliance of the lamina itself. It also has to do with what's holding in place, and that is the circumpapillary scleral uh, tissue as well. There tends to be reversal of bowing after pressure reduction. That happens more in patients who are younger, where the pressure is lowered a lot more, and there's more bowing to begin with. Sort of makes sense. Let me uh, show you a couple of examples. These are three different cases in this publication. And this column represents the position of the lamina before trabeculectomy 
and after, before and after. So you can see there's some springing back of the lama and probably some increased tension of the peripapillary squell ring. It's also been suggested that a baseline appearance of the lamina may predict the future course. So in this study, um, the ganglion cells were thought to be more vulnerable in glaucoma the size that had greater posterior bowing of the lamina to begin with. And this may, you know, if, if you think about it, it makes sense. This may simply be that uh, prior disease, prior progression predicts future and more progression, something that we know uh, to be true in glaucoma. And this is the uh, uh, scatter plot that supports that data. The, the authors here use this broken stick model, although uh, sort of a linear relationship probably works as well. But there does seem to be a threshold beyond which um, the, uh, the rate of glaucomatous damage increases with a certain amount of posterior bowing. So perhaps already a certain amount of damage and there's likely to be more damage. What about the pores? Well, there is increased beam thickness uh, to pore size ratio. Um, there is eventually greater pore variability and in end stages, I think there is some coalescence of, of pores. Uh, the visibility and resolution on imaging is not great. Uh, this was a paper from a few years ago which, which imaged the uh, pores and the laminar beams. And the green indicates the position of the laminar beams. The red indicates the pores. And this is on one example where the visibility was pretty good. But there are a, a lot of technical issues related to this. Three-dimensional reconstructions of uh, tissue in which there's good uh, image penetration is going to be important. What about focal defects? These, are, these I think, are very fascinating and very relevant to all of us. Uh, these can be either holes in the lamina or disinsertions of the lamina from the surrounding scleral ring. These are often associated with disc hemorrhages. They can be associated peripapillary schesis uh, cavities in the outer retina. They have the, clear, the clinical appearance of what we call acquired pits, and I'll show you some examples of those. Uh, and they imply that there is faster visual field progression. So here's a OCT. This is on FOS and longitudinal sections of some holes in the lamina. You can see the holes clear through the lamina. Uh, and the next uh, example shows some disinsertions from the edge of the sclera. You can see here on FOS and then longitudinally, see the lamina has pulled away from, the, uh, from that scleral uh, spur. Spur is not the right word, but you know what I mean. Uh, here's a good example of a clinical phenotype associated with this kind of uh, laminar hole or disinsertion. There's a hole here. So if you uh, uh, consider this disc to be um, made out of putty, for instance, and you put your finger straight through it, down into it, you get this deep hole and you can't see the bottom of it. That's what these pits uh, look like. This is a required pit of the optic nerve. Uh, this, um, I can't tell if this is a disinsertion or, or a hole in the lamina. It might be a disinsertion. They're often associated with these dense defects that come quite close to fixation. It's important, I think, to start to identify uh, POAG phenotypes. You know, we talk about glaucoma, even primary open angle glaucoma, as if it was one disease. Well, it's not, I think. It, it's probably lots of different diseases which have a common final pathway of type of uh, optic nerve rot and visual, visual function loss that we call glaucoma. But analyzing phenotypes may start to give us uh, a better understanding of the disease and may help us associate uh, the phenotypes with uh, genotypes, which are really quite numerous and complicated in glaucoma, so the primary open angle glaucoma. So I'd like to share with you one phenotype of POAG patients, which is associated with systemic disorders and is uh, particularly vulnerable to optic nerve damage at low pressures. This acquired pit of the optic nerve was described uh, long ago. And uh, in, in um, the 1970s, and uh, the association of some types of glaucoma with basal spasm was first pointed out by Flammer uh, in the uh, late 1970s, I believe. 
Uh, in this particular phenotype, there is an acquired pit of the optic nerve of the type I just showed you, and one or more, and often all three, of the following low systolic blood pressure, a history of migraine headaches or migraine variant. There are many, many different variants of migraine. And Raynaud's syndrome. Uh, this is a typical uh, appearance of Raynaud's with this whitening of the fingertips and intense pain. And this is the recovery phase. Um, the pain occurs when, after ischemia, lactic acid builds up and the pH of, the, of, the, of your fingers drops down and it burns. And then when it gets reperfused, the the, uh, the lactic, lactic acid is washed out and your fingers feel better. This is a visual field grid of, of rates. These are rates at each location, not abnormalities. So the darker the square, uh, the faster the rate at that location over a period of time. In patients with pits of this phenotype that I'm talking about and without. And so the patients with pits uh, seem to, to get worse a lot faster and the location of the progression tends to correlate with the location of the pit. Most of them are inferiorly, although uh, sometimes they're superiorly as well. So there is a phenotype of um, acquired pit of the optic nerve and some sort of systemic vascular instability. Can't yet say whether the vascular instability caused that, but there certainly is a strong correlation. These patients are predominantly female in their 50s who demonstrate this rapid progression at relatively low pressure. So identification of this phenotype can help guide not only the recognition of it, but some attempt at individualized treatment, such as uh, frequent visual field testing, because these patients get fast, uh, get, get worse fast. Uh, very low eye uh, pressure. They may require surgery to help to stabilize the disease. Avoid beta blockers. The beta blockers, even topical beta blockers, intensify uh, peripheral vasospasm. And may cause excessive uh, nocturnal dips of uh, blood pressure. I tell these patients uh, that exercise is good. If you like salt, use it. If you want to lay flat, use it. If you want to have your head down when you do yoga, that's all fine. What are the limitations, uh, to summarize now, of, of OCT? Shadowing from vessels, resolution, of not only pores, but the laminar beams, detection of the posterior border. 3D reconstructions are required. Many of these studies I show you have been done in the Asian population and the, their applicability to uh, Western uh, populations is, is still unknown. But it helps us to understand mechanisms. It helps us to describe phenotypes, which may be important for individualized treatment. It helps us to measure response to treatment, maybe. Maybe it helps us to have a target pressure, we want to see the lamina spring back after pressure reduction. Uh, it could be a predictor of progression. I think that's coming. And maybe even a, a predictor of some patients who improve after robust pressure reduction. Thank you very much.